So let's um, transition into the discussion for topic two. And I guess I, I don't want to dictate this, but let's give it a little bit of structure and think about this relationship between what's happening in the genomics of disease within the NIH portfolio and the relationship between that portfolio and how that could guide <clears throat> NHGRI in thinking about a next phase for ENCODE and what it might look like and what that relationship is. And I could see in, in multiple areas, one was a lot of, quote, follow-up of, um, of various signals. The other that Nancy foc focused on is, is really the, the role of, of transcriptional regulation at, in, in disease. And the other is, several of us mentioned annotation. And I'll just seed this conversation a little bit is, you know, there's several of us in this room have spent a lot of time over the last probably three years thinking about loss of function mutations and how we would leverage loss of function variants in proteins and mostly premature stop codons. Is, 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 is that, can that guide us, not the loss of function variants in proteins, but can we think about loss of function in ENCODE sort of annotations or marks? Is, is, that a, is that an analogy, loss of function in an enhancer, naturally occurring or engineered, and how we could use that in, in the understanding disease, just as a seed the conversation a little bit. Um, maybe I'll call on Daniel first, just to sort of pick up on that, and then Dana had a comment. Sure, Again, I'm not going to sort of MC this, hopefully it's I think it's a fascinating idea, and I know Tuli and I actually had some discussions yesterday about this idea of identifying these, you know, regulatory true loss of function mutations, which, you know, may be challenging. There are certainly people in this room that know far better than I do how, what proportion and what types of mutations within these regulatory regions would really result in these types of very severe effects on gene expression. But definitely in the, in the way that we know that we can use coding protein truncating variants to really identify human models for gene inactivation in a way that's very useful, and I know you were involved in it, and we've got a number of projects in this area as well. If we could identify those, those tissue-specific knockouts, that would be phenomenally powerful as well to help to dissect out the specific roles of particular genes in a particular tissue context. That would, you know, be a really powerful in vivo model for, for gene inactivation. Mark? I'm certainly very interested in that topic. <laughs> I, I'm certainly very interested in that topic of uh, sort of um, very deleterious um, non-coding mutations, as I'm sure lots of people in this room are. I, I think a better comparison, though, is not the loss of function, it's between synonymous and non-synonymous, in, in the sense that I don't think there's any mutation in, say, a TF binding site that's quite the same as a premature stop codon. I mean, I, I just don't, I don't think it's the same thing. I think there are things that disrupt the motif. And you can see they radically disrupt the motif, but I, I just don't think you're going to see something like a premature stop. Maybe other people will disagree with that. I don't know. Nancy, do you have a comment on that? I mean, what about small, what about deletions of enhancers? Well, but sure, fair enough. Exactly. I mean, I yeah. deletions, that's the classic, right? Yeah. That's the yeah. Yeah. Yep. and the solid yeah. type of uh, Yeah. So, it's the, you know, the, the equivalent of a stop codon mutation non-coding DNA, the question is how many and what's the total cumulative yeah. burden on disease? Yeah. And I would wager that the cumulative burden on disease is going to be, made, we know it's much greater. So, so the point is that, uh, I, I mean, we all understand what the problems may be, but not all binding sites are the same. I showed you a very small example where there are, you know, three, both three compelling factors, but they have very different effects. So, so I, I think these kinds of effects exist. Uh, so far, we've not had a good way of pinpointing exactly which ones we should pay attention to. Uh, despite having ENCODE, we need still a lot of work. And so having some kinds of examples where we know how to, uh, I don't know, prioritize would be great. Would, I... Dana's next. So. I have two comments. The first one regarding um, all these um, functional studies. I think they're important, but they should be taken in a context of understanding, you know, to get a code, what type of mutations, because for, for genetics, we have to be broad. We have to look at a lot of 
SNPs. We're not going to be able to interrogate them experimentally, all of them. So we're going to have to think of what, not what experiments might be good for a specific disease, but what experiments might be good to give us an understanding so we can impute which variations and how they might influence transcription. And the second comment also relates, again, to seeing which transcripts might change and relates to Nancy's talk. She showed on, on the GTEx 30 cell lines just how much uh, we gain, and I think one of our problems in, in using ENCODE and an encyclopedia towards any genetic and disease is it all matters not only what is the gene, but in what cell type is it being expressed. And I think um, we haven't even begun to even list the, the cell types that we have in our body, let alone begin interrogating which elements might be relevant for each cell type. So I think that needs a, a very big expansion. So I, I'd like to um, put a bit in for Nancy's. I, I heard Nancy's talk as being an um, advocation for endophenotypes, molecular endophenotypes as a, as a way forward. Now, I'd like to rewind at least five years back ago when I settled down. <laughs> I said one of the things that ENCODE should do is a systematic study of gene expression in a number of different individuals, uh, lymphoblastoid cell lines, and, you know, at that point we couldn't cross the stream of ENCODE and variation without somehow setting off some explosion inside of an HGRI. <laughs> um, and I think we got to, you, you know, I think NHGRI's got to get over that. So, uh, so I think, you know, it's, you know, GTEx is a starting point, but there's no real reason why RNA is the blessed uh, endophenotype. Uh, for this. I, I don't think this, so I think Nancy showed one way of using that in disease association. I think when you use these things, you can also use this for a lot of basic biology as well. So you understand which enhancers are doing what and, and the links. And, you know, how environment feeds into this, a credible reason, a credible place for memory is epigenetics on the chromatin for how long-lived environmental effects persist in, in some of these responses. It's not the only place. So, so I could imagine three credible good reasons to do molecular endophenotyping in cohort studies. That's which is basically what's going on. Now, in effect, this is partly happening in the blueprint in blood, because Hank's project has that. Um, there's another project for you to track, which is this stem cell project happening in the UK uh, between Wellcome Trust called HIPSKI. Um, and, and the MRCs, which is basically doing molecular endophenotyping of stem cells. I think that's going to be very useful. How many? Uh, uh, 300, 300 normal, uh, 500 normal healthy volunteers. <clears throat> and that's ramping up. Um, but I think there's going to be a lot of gaps in the tissues and the endophenotypes to be done there. Um, it's a much more complicated landscape than it was five years ago because there's a lot more existing projects. So working out what one does, when, where, how, is tricky, but at the very least, things need to be coordinated between ENCODE and these other projects like GTEx. But I think I think there's much more space there than just coordination. There's there's really something missing. Uh, in that. Nancy, do you want to pull I off just, of that? I just wanted to to come back to protein because I I think <clears throat> we we have more data today on the transcriptome, and so it's possible to do some things with transcriptome that, that, that's useful and interesting to do. We we know that some of this is about how transcript levels carry through to protein levels. But there's no substitute for doing more in the protein space. And the, the, the opportunity to push that technology and get better quality data and more data in single cells, in tissues, I, I don't think can be avoided. This is, this is the fundamental biology that we know is driving disease, and if that's our topic, we have to do better in the protein space. I mean, that argues for that argues for shotgun proteomics, really. Yeah. Uh, and, no, and, nothing uh, argues for uh, shotgun among proteomics. Other, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm a, let me interrupt here. I'm assuming that NHGRI has gotten over whatever phobia existed five years ago. Okay, good, because that's off the table. Evidently, there was a, this was before, so maybe Ewan can help me a little bit. There was previously a, an anxiety about doing a lot of 
encode type assays and, and, and related that's, to if, it, if it's if it's um, all water under the bridge I, let's leave it among you, individuals you know. and looking at genetic variation yeah yeah Aviv first then Mike then John I'll try here go ahead just to say a few words on the protein and transcriptome aspect um, you I think several there are several items to consider if one would go, want to go after protein levels the first is that without a good annotation, shotgun proteomics doesn't work. So no matter what one decides to do with the proteins, which I think should actually be measured and it's very important, one would need a very good annotation. The second is that for certain applications, and especially when you want to be quantitatively very precise or go into a very large number of individuals or go to single cells, antibodies would become a major piece of the puzzle. Um, and the third aspect is that ribosome profiling sits in a very interesting niche in between. It yes. does not give you protein levels because it gives you protein, it gives you a measure of protein translation slash, pro, or actually initiation of translation slash production. It's not it's all exactly the same. But for most proteins, it would give you a lot of very useful information, yes. again, in the face of a good. So this is one of those problems that you would have to triangulate with various methods in order to get results that are reliable enough, that you could map with, and so on. But I think we have sufficient number of pieces in place, some of which can go into production like this, and some of which will come at the tail end and get developed. Yeah, we're talking about several kinds of projects here. This last one being phenotyping, and I think it's an attractive space. It is in, in the space in between G-text and ENCODE, and I think it's valuable space to explore and, and, and do. Um, I think protein levels is one thing. You mentioned uh, uh, riboseq is another assay that's certainly good and, and very amendable to high throughput. Actually, another one that's incredibly high throughput is, is metabolomics. So if you really want to explore the space, there are several assays that aren't that expensive um, that could be done, could pick up variants, could be mapped onto the genome in a useful fashion, does give functional annotation to the genome. So there, there is that class of things. I think you introduced us originally, Eric, with the idea, though, of more of other kinds of assays, and, and we've heard about CRISPR and, and I guess, <clears throat> uh, in the last talk with the, um, you know, I guess, <clears throat> uh, reporter assays. I, I think that is a useful thing to explore, too, with all the limitations each has. Obviously, CRISPR knockouts. Um, <clears throat> there's problems with redundancy when you're knocking out one element. And, getting a picture in the assays being sensitive enough if it's only subtle, but they're still incredibly valuable to do. I, I mean, it all comes back to this issue. Every one of these assays uh, does have some value with some more meaningful than others. What I, li what I like about this last set of discussion is that these are real variants that affect people's um, physiology at some point, and so they, they certainly should have high impact. Uh, in terms of, you know, human disease and human phenotypes. John? Yeah, on, the, on the proteins, I wanted to make, make two comments. One, there is a set of protein measurements that directly intersects uh, the current type of ENCODE data, and that is, uh, that, that could directly intersect, and that is quantitative, accurate measurements of the levels of all the transcription factors, for starters, okay? If we could actually achieve that, because that is a variable that has a direct impact and readout on what the other assays are measuring, and, and it would also be incredibly useful in, you know, in, in a broader context. So that's something I think that's fairly concrete. The other thing I want to raise, and this is something I was going to bring up yesterday, um, and this is this question of what are we not measuring, and, and what is the role of the ENCODE catalog in determining the things that get measured. And so I was just at this meeting um, uh, in Monterey that was uh, kind of a celebration for uh, uh, Goldstein and Brown's you know, Nobel Prize from, from 30 years ago, and there were a litany of just amazing talks uh, on finding um, you know, various aspects of you know, starting with, uh, with disease phenotypes and then, and then coming down and, and unraveling the molecular basis. And one of the amazing things that came up in, in one of the talks is the fact that there is a class of proteins in the genome that are short peptides that are parked inside long non-coding, supposedly non-coding RNAs, and these have, turn out to have an incredibly important role 
and they're not annotated systematically in the genome because they fall below the false discovery threshold that was picked for ORFs. And, and here they are, they found them, and, and, and you kind of wonder, you know, these things are 20 amino acids, 25 amino acids, you kind of wonder how much more of that kind of stuff is out there that's in incredibly important when you find it that we're just not part of the catalog at a really basic level. And, and I think that, again, just kind of this general topic that if we don't know it, we can't go and measure it, uh, it has to be, you know, considered. Other comments on this thread? Aravinda? You know, there, there are obviously many, you know, many excellent ideas. I mean, I, I'm just going to be very pedestrian for a minute and ask everyone to think, what is it that we can do in the next few years with all these literally thousands, probably now tens of thousands of variants with respect to many traits that we've already mapped? And, and in, in some sense, um, you know, it is calling success and moving on. But we need some, I mean, beyond the basic understanding of what ENCODE and what all these elements do, uh, there should be some attempt to sort of resolve the meaning of all of these non-coding variants that we've already found. The problem is they're not precisely mapped, right? So well, so, so that's the problem that we've got to uncover. <laughs> so when you is there a way? Add them all up, you're probably talking about a lot of the genome, but you have to put them in the context of how they were mapped, of course. I, I, I agree. I'm not trying to design the project, but all I'm saying is there could be a few examples, whomsoever's examples they are, yeah. where it might teach us a lot as to, you know, of even finding the remainder that we know exists, but we haven't yet detected. And, and, and I think at least some aspects of this project are soluble. So are, are you suggesting that basically there's a parallel effort of selected deep dives that are intended to establish mm -hmm. paradigms? I, I, I think there are enough assays, enough basic data in, in, you know, in systems for which either the tissues have been looked at enough, you know, enough has been looked at to then go and find a phenotype where that can be tested out. That is, what is the, you know, right now the value of ENCODE is being tested by essentially random picks. And sometimes, yes, we know there may be a potential element, but the cell type isn't studied or we don't know expression or whatever. But it may be helpful to have a few examples, could be in the human, could be in the mouse, where we try to figure out whether knowing the non-coding elements, not the full biology, we can not only map the identities of the variants we've already mapped, but find all the rest of what the heritability of that means. I really, you know, anyway, I, I think that's the problem we need to solve. Let me make one comment before we go on. How about looking at the problem this way? Ross, I think it was, had this matrix, this multidimensional matrix of cell types, assays, and environments, and somebody calculated there were 18 million or 8 million cells or something. And people, and people, 800 million, people chuckled, ha, 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 ha. Is, is use this comment you know, based on phenotypes driven, to pick the cells to do the deep drop dive. So you don't do what is you guys said, 800 million cells. You pick the cells of interest to the community. Not the, not the cells now. These are cells in a matrix, not cells in a body. You pick the cells in a matrix that are driving, that are of interest to the community. That's just my comment. Go ahead. I would actually somewhat disagree with this. I, I do actually really, I mean, we obviously need the deep dives, but I don't, I think the biggest priority of ENCODE and the power of ENCODE is that we're starting, you know, whatever nice keyword you want to say, figuring out the regulatory code or whatever. But the thing is, we don't actually know what is going to be important, right? So we don't want to then go backwards and say, okay, you know, we're going to decide this is the most important thing and we'll focus on it and we'll find something, right? I mean, obviously, if we zero into an important disease and we zero into the variants around genes that we sort of know are implicated, we will find nice stories. And there's no question that NHGRI should find, find some of it and hopefully some of the other institutes will pick diseases, you know, so this is very inspiring, right, every talk that we've heard today. But I do think that the fundamental value of ENCODE and this and uh, what we really could only do through a project like ENCODE is this 
broad coverage, right? The, and that's going to be where the disease, I mean, even if you don't want the basic biology argument, if you want purely disease argument, right? How are we going to figure out which ones of those non-coordinating variants are functional? By looking at which ones affect chromatin, right? And we see that from this broad coverage of ENCODE data. And of course, we do need to get more functional. We need to look at enhancers. We need to think of functional assays. But I think in the context of ENCODE, we really have to focus on high throughput assays that will allow us to look at these things, maybe not perfectly, but with a reasonable estimate of their accuracy, right? And then we would, and I think the random, actually random checking of basically confidence levels in our functional assays and how well they're working is exactly what we need to do because that will let us know how well things work, right? So that would be my, my big push. I think this is kind of echoing what Dana was trying to say earlier. But let me get on the other side of the fence just for discussion purposes is, the, the problem with that is you end up investing a lot and doing an enormous amount of work that has no relevance to the human condition. And my guess is NHGRI is under pressure to, to, to translate, to, con to continuously translate these resources into human health and disease. And, and if you, we try to look at, fill out all 800 million cells, Oh, no, my no, guess by is no many means. of them will not be relevant to human conditions. Just, just to quickly answer, I, I completely agree. My point is just we don't know how to pick the cell. I do think we should pick cell types that are relevant to human conditions. Mm -hmm. I just don't think we should pick a cell, right? And because we don't know which cell. We, we probably haven't seen the most important encoding variants. That's what we're seeing from GWAS, right? Like that essentially we're missing the vast majority of heritability. Okay, Aviv. And I've totally lost control, by the way. Somebody. So, <laughs> To, to, I think to kind of bridge the difference a little, I think the assumption that we know which cell is relevant in which disease is not necessarily true in a lot of the complex diseases. There might be more than one, but it also might just not be the one. I think one of the lessons learned from some of the GYCs, it wasn't necessarily where people thought it was. Definitely. And I think it's increasingly so as more and more genes are. So that's one of the, I, I think that that matrix is not going to be spanned just by hitting on a few cell types, but it's also not going to be spanned by just sparsifying completely and randomly choosing from the 800 million elements. There's going to be some choices to go deep and some efforts to go broad, just like there have been before, but how these dimensions would work is going to be different. And the specific knowledge of what is expressed where, if you already know where the variants are mapping in terms of genes, is going to be particularly important for that. Okay. Aravinda, then Mark. By the way, it's, um, Aviv said to split the difference. I actually don't think that there's a lot of difference. I just want to clarify one aspect that, that um, um, Olga said, you know, that she disagrees. I don't think there's much to disagree in the sense that, you know, much of the history of genetics is nothing but studying, you know, extreme phenotypes and mutants. I mean, that's how we've understood the normal. So I think I'm not speaking of taking a phenotype or a disease. Uh, I think we're looking at it perhaps incorrectly as saying we will learn normal biology and mm -hmm. then apply it to disease. I think disease itself will informs us about those aspects of the normal biology that perhaps we need to focus on most. Yeah. I agree. I mean, we don't know how to choose, but my point is practically we will be cho making choices of those however many billions of experiments. So an example can often focus our mind uh, this was the basis of me asking this question of Eric Green yesterday. I mean, you know, the biology is easy to focus on and the clinical, you know, applications may be easy, but finding good examples that can make us bridge the gap, I think, is now a particular challenge. Mark? So I, I just want to sort of uh, come back to the thread that was uh, raised by, I guess, you and then Mike and Nancy were talking about um, how sort of ENCODE relates to um, human variation. And, you know, I, I just want to point out that what happens all the time when we talk about ENCODE annotation, you very much saw this in your talk, is you look at the annotation and then people talk about how it relates to disease variants. And so there's always this desire for this connection. And really, I think the missing step, though, is how natural variation fits into the middle of that. And, and you know, and I, th I think it really would help, you know, ENCODE if we had some sense of that natural variation in the middle or something like that before we connected it to disease variation. And I should say that, 
you know, a lot of the critics of ENCO, we should think about, it, a lot of these critics have really looked at what we've done and said that we've done it without really looking too much at natural variation and evolution. And I really think that's an important thing to incorporate very integrally into the whole thing. Okay, just a second. John? I mean, it seems to me you, you, nobody, you can't avoid the variation issue, right? It's everywhere and it's now emerged as a major application of, of ENCODE. But, but it seems the role of the project is to provide the framework for the interpretation of the variation. There's just too much variation out there, right? That's why, like, people were scared of crossing the streams and exploding, right? Because there's just too much. And so you can't go and measure it all. So, you know, a, a, a focused effort to figure out a way to, to predict the consequence of variation with some testing, right, enough to show that it works, and then deepening whatever other aspects of the project. But it can really only be addressed at the framework level. And I think that removes the question of what's the, you know, if you pick this disease or that disease on a formal basis, the rest of the people are going to complain, right, if it's not their area. But if you just kind of make it known that you're just focusing on the framework, enabling everybody, a few test cases, that then, then it takes on a different complexion. And it's also more tractable. Yeah. So Mike first, then Dana, then Ewan. Oh, Ra Ra I'm sorry. I told oh, okay. you I've lost control. Well, this was, uh, I was going to say something that John just said. And, and, and uh, obviously, uh, uh, you're, if you focus in one area, a lot of people feel left out for good reason. Now, Nancy, I think you showed us for type to diabetes, that there was a lot of sharing of regulatory programs among tissues. I, I think that was on one of your slides. Type one yeah, oh, it's that type. Okay, and and uh, and I would there be value in if we're, if you do choose something to focus on, focus on these genes that which are, are widely expressed. They're still regulated, and their regulation is important. But that the, the that the, uh, there are multiple cell types that are sharing these uh, regulatory uh, uh, paradigms. So that, that, that might be one, one sort of, a, that's my compromise position I'm offering. Okay. So, so I guess my thoughts are that if we chose several key systems that would, it could impact a lot of the discussion going on now. For example, obviously the cardiovascular space is huge and if you pick something you know, like cardiomyocyte differentiation is a good model system. I think if we picked a half a dozen key systems that became part of the next phase of ENCODE where we did deep dives, it would be a reference for a lot of things, could have impact in many ways, could bring in all the variation things we're talking about as well, and then you just pick some of the most important disease areas. Now, I, granted, there'll be a tussle over that, but cardiovascular disease, you know, number one killer, something in that space is reasonable. Diabetes would be great, although until recently I haven't heard about good systems for being able to measure things. So there's, there's some cell-based systems that makes that, that part tricky. But you could, you know, one reason we picked liver was because, you know, liver diseases are out there and, and now you can get hepatocyte differentiation going, uh, you know, in iPS cells. So I think you could drill into a half a dozen of these key areas that ENCO could do a deep dive on. Be a great reference for all the reasons that Olga and others said that would help the community, you can finally get dynamics in, which I think would give us some basic principles that would be really great, in this case, probably developmental dynamics, and that's fine. Um, and then I think also you can roll the variation in, either in collaboration with GTEx or somebody else, and you know, possibly add other assays. <clears throat> I certainly would like to see that. And I think you can marry all this together and have a half a dozen reference systems that would just be hugely impactful in many, to many, many individuals around the world, many scientists in many respects. So let me so ask Elise a question. Thought. I was actually going to ask her there, but she's, how much co-funding is there of ENCODE from other institutes? And could, is this a way of, I believe Eric uses the word partnership frequently. Is this a way of forging new partnerships to help support the future of ENCODE by these deep dives relevant to particular conditions? So, so currently there, there is no co-funding from other, other institutes, but clearly this would be an opportunity for forming bridges. I mean, we have had conversations with, with specific institutes who are interested in learning about ENCODE uh, data, and we, but we haven't moved into concrete ideas for proposals. Okay, Dana's been very patient. Unlike your typical self. Um, I actually want to make a new plug for natural variation, not in terms of we need to catalog it and characterize it for, for its own right, but 
we've been discussing a lot how we're actually going to see what's functional, what's not, the limitations of all these uh, functional assays. And natural variation is a very powerful natural assay to figure out what's functional and not functional, things that nature has already chosen, it, chosen itself. And we could look at um, impact without having to engineer ourselves of a lot of variation and where and how it impacts uh, different um, regulatory elements and um, different uh, epigenetic elements. And we can actually, that's, that's one way to assay it rather than all these sort of CRISPR derived or whatever genetic screens. It also, another advantage of it is that nature chose these variations to do something. They're subtle. It's not a hard deletion of removing an entire element, so we can actually get quantitative modeling uh, in from such natural variation. It's a actually very powerful way to understand what these elements are doing. So I, I was just going to, we haven't in this topic uh, mentioned model organisms, and I just want to point out that there are these huge advantages in trying to work out how about building effective models in these organisms. They really give you opportunities that it's very hard to match in other species. So, you know, Drosophila, C. elegans, zebrafish, all of them give you the ability to do things at such incredible scale and with such incredible detail. So in C. elegans, the, 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 the lineage is remarkable to leverage for this. Um, and I think we're going to now, whether this is part of an established program or whether this is just yet another argument to continue to do work in model organisms, I don't know. But there's a real, I think, many discoveries about how chromatin components interact and feed into gene biology at a conceptual level will be made in those species. And so I would want to see, I, I think NHGRI should, should make sure that the links to those leading model organisms are still kept in place. Great. So, uh, thank you. I think we're going to um, have to keep ourselves on time here because we have a really packed schedule before everyone has to leave. So, um, I think also that during the discussion right after lunch, we're really going to have to get concrete um, in terms of some of these recommendations. And I am seeing some themes already between the different topics. So, I think. It's, it's going to be very feasible. But I want to thank all the speakers this morning. Um, we're going to have a quick coffee break.